the next thing I want to turn to though is, okay, so we have all of this information right now, and I'm going to focus on what we have clinically available, and that is the somatic mutations that occur in acute myeloid leukemia. Now, keeping in mind that the people watching um, are going to be a group of um, academicians and clinical investigators like ourselves, but a large number of people out there are the, the people on the front lines, the clinical um, uh, people who are seeing these patients. And so what I'd like, Eunice, for you to discuss is what is clinically important in terms of mutational analysis at the time of diagnosis for a person with acute myeloid leukemia? Well, so that is a, a, a moving target, okay? So, you know, when you look at the treatment guidelines, there's different treatment guidelines, there's different molecular classifications, there's different recommendations on which mutations need to be done by different panels, you know, like the American College of Pathologists, the NCCN, the ELN, they all recommend different ones. So on a practical basis, I think that uh, when I'm looking at a newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia patient, what are the ones that I absolutely have to have? Um, I think it's very important to know whether they have a core binding factor mutation. Uh, that is very important. FLT3, uh, there are inhibitors for FLT3, IDH1, IDH2. Uh, we currently have a, an inhibitor for that, uh, IDH2, and there may be one coming for IDH1. NPM1 is also prognostic. Um, if I had a choice of some of the other ones, um, there are ones that definitely portend poor prognosis. So I am interested in knowing whether they have AXL1. I'm interested in knowing whether they have TP53. If I could get them, I would also be interested in getting spliceosome mutations because as you mentioned, Terry, they're very predictive for patients having a secondary AML. So I think the basic ones for me right now are NPM1, FLT3, IDH1, IDH2, but one, um, what we typically do at our institute is at the time of diagnosis, uh, when we collect those samples, we will send off for a few of those targeted genes. And what we actually do, which you know is not, I'm fully aware is not available at everybody's uh, private practice, is we biobank. So we actually um, take the cells, we extract the RNA and the DNA, and we put it in our bank. And that allows us to have the flexibility um, when we get additional information like karyotypic information um, to do additional mutation testing. So it's a stepwise thing. So 50% we know of patients are going to have normal karyotype. Okay. Uh, so those are the ones that I'm really going to want to do detailed mutational testing on it. If you have a complex karyotype, you have an aneuploidy, right, those are already bad prognosis. So that already tells me a little bit about what um, features are there. If I get a secondary uh, or AML myelodysplastic related cytogenetic changes, again, that's going to focus my future mutational testing. So that's the way that we sort of triage so that we don't do that. Another way to do it would be in addition to biobanking is to do the opposite approach, which is just to get full next-gen sequencing and sequence everything in that sample. Um, so you have the range of information to not only be making the decisions now, but down the line. But I mean, I think that there is is a, a huge amount of uh, variability. You know, Jorge, what do you do at your yeah. facility? Yeah, I, I, we, we, we do have a, an extensive panel that we do for all the patients, but I think we need to, we need to differentiate here a, a little bit between what has direct clinical implications today and what we're doing in terms of generate knowledge and, and, and advance these and try to help us understand these for the future because if we're just going to do it clinically, you know, there are panels that, that can look at 400 different genes, but, but for a lot of them, we don't even know what they mean. So, right. so you get a lot of, 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 of data that, and, and it doesn't generate knowledge when you do it for individual patients. So, so we do it for everybody, but we're, we're trying to develop that database to, to do that. What you do for certain mutations, as you described, there are a few that have either a direct intervention that we have for three IDH, et cetera, or at least have a significant prognostic implication that it changes maybe your approach uh, in terms of um, whether you're going to use a transplant or not, for example, or, or how sometimes they can know. predict resistance. Like there's like FLT3 ITD, DMNT3A, that's a pretty bad one Correct. to have, right? A absolutely, yes. And uh, actually, I was going to ask you, you mentioned some of the others. What about P53? What, what do yeah. you think on, on P53? That's, right, I uh, think T53 is... Many of us, we're, we're leaning towards giving hypomethylating agents more and more for a P53 mutated patient, even as frontline therapy in a fit patient, knowing that ultimately we want to transplant that patient. And we're kind of on the fence of do we want to start the clock by inducing them if we achieve a remission we need to be immediately available to go to transplant but we may not have a donor right away so we might use a hypomethylating agent which in studies has shown reasonably high response rates and isn't going to largely make the patient ill in a way that 
induction might, so that buys us a little time, and that information right off the bat is, can be helpful. Um, my take on, on this is it used to be that we would want to start therapy immediately, almost without regard to many of these diagnostic studies. And more and more, we're trying to get more information even before starting so that we make sure if there are new drugs that help certain subsets, we're basically allocating the right therapy to the right patient based on some of these. We might use a different induction strategy for a patient with a core binding factor mutation, a gene fusion of uh, A21 or inversion 16, than what we would for a patient with a normal karyotype or a abnormal karyotype, high-risk karyotype. Uh, secondary AML that we knew uh, has AML with myelodysplasia-related changes only by the karyotype. Um, we might need some karyotypic information, and that can take time, so it's hard to do that. We're trying to speed up our diagnostic tests to get more information now faster. Um, sometimes we're using fish panels in patients who might be appropriate candidates for therapies that have a proven benefit in AML with myelodysplasia-related changes where we could make that diagnosis based on karyotypic information.